we have a special guest speaker that is going to be with us for two weeks, and he's doing a short Christmas series that we're looking forward to. He is very familiar to standing on this stage, very accustomed to being here, but he has not been here for three and a half years is what I know. Three and so would years. you help me welcome our former pastor, Jim Stewart. Let's yeah. make a big hand for him as he comes. All right. I, I'm not going to leave yet. Okay. Quick moment. Before, uh, let, let us all know what you've been doing in retirement. Well, the main thing is growing a beard. Yeah, you look great. <laughs> you look so hot in that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, retirement has been um, unsu uh, surprisingly busy. Um, so we have four children, David. Yes. And uh, three of them got married during re after I've been retired. Yes. So uh, that's been amazing. And uh, uh, so on a... Other note, uh, two of my sisters passed away, oh. so, so that's been kind of tough. Um, but uh, yeah, and uh, one of the things I've been doing, David, which is um, I never expected to do, is I'm serving as a docent at the Palos Verdes Interpretive Center. As and, a what? Uh, yeah, that's right. A docent. Docent. Yeah, it's docent. not a culter, is he? it? Well, it's no, I... sort of. <laughs> so uh, a docent is a person who, um, it is usually found in a museum who's a guide, yeah. but I've been doing, I've been leading you hikes. You talked to me about that. Sounds yeah, like a yeah, lot of fun. Yeah, it has been. Leading hikes and all that stuff, showing right. people. Awesome. Well, I'm not going to take too much of your time, but I, I do want you to know uh, how much this congregation loves and appreciates you and your mm. wife. And one of the things when we, uh, a while back, about a month ago, we were cleaning out a bunch of storage areas that you should have cleaned, but you didn't, and you left it for me to do. And so uh, we were yeah, cleaning. Yeah, yeah. We were cleaning that all out, and we found. My, my wife just says <laughs> that's consistent with the way I am at home as well. We right. found a big box of old Journey South Bay oh, yeah. postcards. Yeah, I remember and, those. And, we're, and someone said, "Oh, we're not going to use those anymore." And I said, "Wait, wait, wait, wait." So we kept them. Oh. And so for the last two, three weeks, uh, the, the members of this church have been writing on them uh, what we appreciate about you guys. David. And so we're going to be giving that to you next week. Wow. Uh, just to let you know. And I thought it would be appropriate to read my card to you. Wow. Okay. And I don't know you terribly well. We've had lunch. And, but uh, this is my card to you. Dear Jim, when I think of you, I have two very intense feelings. Okay. First, I'm insanely jealous of your voice. When I imagine what God sounds like, I hear you. Wow. Uh, I do. I'm convinced my sermons would be much better with your voice. Oh, well. Okay. The second feeling I have is incredible gratefulness. It has become obvious very quickly how well you shepherded and led Journey South Bay. I'm indebted to you for your great work in ministry. Thank you, and pop into Journey South Bay anytime you want. Wow. Thank you, sir. That was now, I, uh, I, as a preacher, I know that the person introducing the preacher wants him to stop so you can have more time to preach. So I'm going to pray for you and okay, then let you bring the word. Great. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jim. We thank you for his ministry to this church uh, and his faithful um, service to you. Father, I pray that you would now soften our hearts, prepare mm -hmm. our minds, not to hear from Jim, but to hear from you. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. All right. Well, it is great to be back here. It also feels a little weird. <laughs> I, I was, Beth and I drove to church this morning, and I haven't drove, driven that route on Sunday morning for almost three years. And so it's been, uh, it was, it's been great to be back. I, I would just say for Beth and I, we've missed you guys and uh, loved you. And um, I would say that so, so grateful for the time that we've had here with you guys. In fact, I was thinking about it besides my wife and my children, um, the time I had here as your pastor were the highlights of my life. And just so it's such a meaningful, meaningful time for me. So great to be back, grateful for you guys. Grateful for you, David. Thank you for your hospitality, for your warm welcome to me. And I am so excited about the future for Journey South Bay. Man, I picked it up. Your energy this morning is contagious, brother. And I am so excited for where God's going to be taking your church and the days to come. So I'm very, very thankful for that. All right. Well, um, as David said, a two-week Christmas series, Advent series. And uh, 
I, as I was thinking about that, I realized over my time here at Journey, uh, I preached 19 Advent series. And I thought, you know, I'm not going to do a new one. <laughs> so I, uh, I thought back, I thought, okay, what, what series, Advent, you know, Latin for coming or the, the, the uh, arrival of Jesus first and also looking ahead to the second time, but which Advent series is most memorable in my mind? And to be honest, out of those 19, only a couple came to my mind. I, I couldn't even remember all the series I did. Isn't that horrible? Um, but so this morning, I'm going to preach one of the ones that uh, was memorable to me. So some of you may, a few of you, hopefully, will recognize it. Most of you won't. Uh, but it's, it's, and I'm not saying it's even my best. There's just one that's stuck in my mind. So I'm going to share that with you this morning. Um, so let me, let me jump into it, and uh, let me jump into it by asking you a question, and that question is this. How many of you remember or even saw the movie uh, four or five years ago called Ford versus Ferrari? Any of you guys? Okay, good, good, good. So I went to that movie with my son, JJ, who is a car fanatic. He loves cars, and I don't usually go to movies and theaters, but JJ and I, my son, went to, this, to the movie to see... Ford versus Ferrari, and we're sitting in the theater, and you know, it finally gets really dark right before the main uh, feature comes up, and, and so it gets dark, and then all of a sudden the surround sound comes alive. But there's no picture on the screen, just the sound, and you hear these cars, and they're just like maxing up the tack on the RPMs, and it's coming, to, and it, it gets louder and louder and louder. And then suddenly, boom, Matt Damon's on the screen playing, you know, Carol Shelby. And all of a sudden, you're at Le Mans, 1959, on the track. And you're going around these hairpin turns, and it's foggy, and it's rainy, and you feel like you're in the car. And I lean over to JJ and say, I think I'm going to like this movie, and it's going to be great. And wouldn't you agree that a, a great movie or a great book has a great introduction? It's got an introduction that hooks you, that grabs you, that says, I want to go. I want to see the rest of this film. I want to read the rest of that book. And, and so this morning, we're looking at the Christmas story, the, the birth of Jesus. And the actual birth of Jesus is recorded for us in two of the Gospels, Luke and Matthew. And so Luke records uh, the most extensive narrative of Jesus' birth, and he starts off with a grabber. I mean, you look, read in Luke chapter 1, and you read about Zacharias, this old priest uh, who's getting a lifetime experience, once in a lifetime, to go into the Holy of Holies. And he goes into the Holy of Holies, and what happens? He sees an angel, and the angel visits him. Now, angels haven't visited Israel for hundreds of years, and suddenly, Zacharias is having an angel right in front of him, and it absolutely freaks him out, as it would freak you and me out. And then this angel has an incredible message to, to Zacharias. And he says to Zacharias, he says, your prayers have been answered. And Zacharias is an old man. His wife is Elizabeth, an old woman. One of their hopes and desires was that they would have children. They were barren. And the angel tells Zacharias that your prayer has been answered. You will have a child. Now, that sounds like Abraham and Sarah, right? But it's, it's, it's the message to Zacharias. And he says, not only will you have a child, this son you're going to have is going to be a forerunner for the Messiah. He's going to prepare the way for the Son of Man to come on earth. And, and Zacharias, and he says, and you're going to name him John. And with all of that, Zacharias couldn't believe what he was hearing or seeing. He couldn't believe it. And so the angel says, because you can't believe it, you will not speak again until this son is born. And man, you are drawn into that story. I've got to find out what happens, right? So with that, let's look at Matthew and how Matthew starts the Christmas narrative. Chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1. You don't have to turn it to it. You can just listen as I read. And it starts like this, okay? Hold on to your seats. Ready? Ready to get grabbed? Here we go. Matthew 1, chapter 1, verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. I'm not done. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of, of Menadab. 
Amenadab, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijab, Abijab, the father of Asa, and you want me to stop right now <laughs> because you are bored to death, right? So why in the world would Matthew start off this greatest story ever told with that introduction? I mean, that doesn't grab you, right? And the reason it doesn't grab you and I is because we are not Jews living 2,000 years ago in Israel. Because you know that the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all wrote for a specific audience. In other words, Luke was writing to Gentiles, Matthew was writing specifically to Jews. And if you were a Jewish person, this is what you want to hear. You want to know for certain because you understand that the Messiah has to come through the line of David. And so Matthew, because he's writing to Jewish people, says right at the front, you need to know this is legit, that Jesus is in the line of Abraham, Jewish of course, and in the line of David. So got your attention in that way, but what really grabbed the Jewish attention with this introduction was who Matthew included in there. And you may or may not have caught it, but in that genealogy, there was four women. Scandalous. I mean, women testimony wasn't even valid in a court of law. And here's Matthew including women in his genealogy. What is he thinking? And not only were those women, I mean, most of them were women of disrepute, you know? I mean, Rahab, we all know who she was, right? And that's in the line of Jesus, the Son of God. I mean, Matthew, what are you doing? And you, had, you, know, you have to include Judah in there, Judah, the son of Jacob. I mean, you had 12 sons to pick. Why do you pick Judah, the guy who lies, who betrays his brother, who, who commits incest? I mean, are you kidding me? Why are you bringing out all this dirty laundry? Now, I don't know if you've ever done a genealogical study of your family tree. Uh, I have not done an extensive one in my family tree because I don't really want to go too deep there. <laughs> exactly. Because I know there's some stuff in my family tree that I'm not proud of that's absolutely humiliating and embarrassing. So I don't want you to know about it. Why does Matthew want you to know about the history of Jesus' family tree? You know why he wants to do that? Because right at the beginning, he wants you and me to understand that the reason Jesus came to this planet on Christmas, the reason he came here was to save imperfect people was to save men and women. And in that genealogy were not just Jews, there were non-Jews in that genealogy. Rahab was a Canaanite. Jesus came for all people with all backgrounds that are messed up. And why is Matthew so sensitive to this issue? Because he was one. He was one messed up dude that should never have had the time of day given to him by the ultimate Messiah and Son of God. And yet, he was chosen by Jesus. So this morning, we want to look a little bit at Matthew's life so that we can understand the character of this great God we love and serve, and that we can understand on a more deeper level the mission that Christ came for 2,000 years ago at Christmas. But before we do that this morning, let's pray. Father God, you are amazing. Lord, right here in this genealogy to put people in there that we would be embarrassed to have in our genealogy. And yet, that's the genealogy that you chose for your son to come through. Lord, help us to understand your heart, your purpose in coming to this planet on a deeper level because of our time 
through your, in your word and through your Holy Spirit this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we're going to look at the time where Matthew becomes a disciple of Christ this morning. He records it in his own gospel here. But let me set that up. So, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 9. But right before Matthew comes on the scene, uh, Jesus is just returned to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is Jesus' headquarters for his ministry. You know, he's born in Nazareth, raised in Nazareth, but as, as a minister, with his public ministry, he picked this town on the Sea of Galilee as his headquarters. And so he's just returned to Capernaum after some ministry journeys, and when he's there, he's teaching in a home, and when he's teaching in this home, people are crowded to listen to him, but there's four men who have a friend who's been a paralytic all his life. And these friends want him desperately to be touched by this healer, this teacher, this rabbi, Jesus. And so they bring him on a pallet to this house to have Jesus hopefully heal him. But when they bring him to the house, they can't get even close to Jesus because there's so many people there. They can't even, they can hear him, but they can't see him. They go, how in the world are we gonna have our friend healed if Jesus is way inside uh, barricaded by all these people. So you remember the story. They get creative. They get ambitious. They get bold. They climb on top of the roof, tear the roof apart, you know, because back then it's dirt and, and branches and tree leaves. They tear that off, and they lower their friend on a pallet right in front of Jesus. I mean, the gall. And Jesus looks at that, and he is so impressed by their faith. And so, and he says to, the, and so he looks at the man, and they're all expecting now, he's going to say, you know, rise, take up your mat, you're healed. But instead, Jesus does what he always does, the unexpected. Instead of that, he turns to the man and says, because of your faith, your sins are now forgiven. What? That's right, your sins are now forgiven. And there's religious leaders in the crowd. And when they hear this, they immediately start saying to one another, blasphemer, blasphemer, blasphemer. He's claiming to be God because only God can forgive sins. Jesus, knowing what they're thinking, knowing what they're saying, stops and, and corrects them and says, you're right. Only God can forgive sins. And by the way, if you ever wonder if Jesus ever proclaimed himself as God, here's a great example of him doing that. He says, you're right, I do have the ability to claim God. But then he says, what's harder? Is it more difficult for a person to, say, pick up your mat and walk or to have your sins forgiven? It's much more difficult to have your sins forgiven because, and by the way, some of us say we want Jesus to be healing us, and, and we all do. But here's the reality. All of us, are gonna die unless Jesus comes back before that. We're gonna die, why? Because we live in a broken world. And we're broken people because of sin. And death is necessary for us to enter into that new world to get those glorified bodies. So a healing now is temporary. But forgiveness of sins is eternal. So our oldest daughter, many of you know, Annie and Pete, uh, Fowler, who were part of the fellowship here, uh, and uh, just about when I retired, they also moved to North Carolina, and we actually hate them for that. Uh, <laughs> we're working on forgiveness, uh, and uh, but uh, they've been going through a tough couple of months because uh, Pete's mother was suddenly died and was in great health, but was suddenly diagnosed with stage four cancer just a couple of months ago, and um, Friday, Friday morning, she went to be with the Lord. The week before, though, she had um, Annie and the kids uh, who live in North Carolina, they live in Pennsylvania, drive nine hours uh, to be there and for the weekend, and she gathered them all around the bed just to let them know how much she loved them and, uh, and to rejoice. And, you know, his mother had a real peace about dying. And the reason she did 
is because she knew that death was just an entrance into eternal life. Her biggest concern was for her husband to be taken care of, and they assured her, her three sons assured her that they were going to be taking care of their dad. And she could die in peace. My hope for you, that if you know Jesus Christ, and that day comes when your health is failing, that you can face death without fear. You can face death with confidence, knowing that your Savior, Jesus Christ, has died for your sins, forgiven your sins, and has risen again, and that you will enter his presence at the moment of death. And I say that because there has been times as a pastor where I've been with Christians who are just panicked over death. And I need you to know now that you don't need to panic. I need you to know now that it's going to be okay because Jesus has this. Amen. So that miracle happened. And of course, Jesus then points to the man. He says, he says, to show that I do have the authority to forgive sins, rise, roll up your mat and go home. And the man is healed. And there is incredible chaos and joy and singing and, and, and ecstatic emotions. Jesus moves from that experience and he's walking through Capernaum. And that's where we're going to pick up the action to find our friend Matthew. So, Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 9. And this is what we read. As Jesus went on from there, and that's the house where he just healed the paralytic, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. So what do we know about Matthew? Lives in Capernaum, and he's a tax collector. So how many of you here just really like paying taxes? <laughs> Is that a fun thing to do? And how many of you here really enjoy getting audited? That's even more fun, right? Do you have to go through all, or, all of your life? I mean, don't you feel, I've never been audited, but it, it feels so invasive. That's Matthew. But Matthew is a lot worse than that because Matthew is employed by an evil government. He's an employee of Rome. Now, Rome occupied Capernaum and all of Israel. And we have all heard of the Pax Romana, the, the peace of Rome. You know, you know how they brought peace to a country? They brought peace to a country by intimidation, by fear. They were kind of uh, organized terrorists, the Rome. And, and what, what went was what the Roman procurator at, the, at whatever city, his word was law. You were, Matthew was gathering taxes to pay Rome. Not to pay Israel, but to pay Rome. And, he, and the reason the Romans would hire local Jewish people to be their tax collectors, guys that were good with numbers, is because the local Jewish guys would know what you had. They're your neighbor. They would know how many goats you had. They would know what chickens you had. You couldn't hide from them. It's like the ultimate auditor. Right? He lives next door to you. How horrible is that? And he is making your life miserable. I mean, who would become a, a tax collector? I mean, that's a pretty vile, despicable career because you've basically turned against your own countrymen. You have betrayed your countrymen to side with the oppressor. And any respecting Jew despised tax collectors. And that's who Matthew is. Matthew sold out. And he sold out for money. And his parents had disowned him. And the synagogue wouldn't let him in because he was unclean. And he was referred to now no longer as a Jewish man. He's a pagan. We're not even going to identify him any longer as a Jew because he's betrayed us. That is who Matthew is. 
And it says here that Jesus saw a man named Matthew. He actually saw Matthew. The other Jewish people never saw Matthew. They disdained him. They hated him. But they never saw him as a person. They just looked right through him. But Jesus saw him. He saw him. And I'm sure when he first locked eyes with Matthew, Matthew felt, oh gosh, Uh, the holy man's looking at me. He's going to condemn me. He's going to harass me. He's going to call me out in front of all the people. But you know, when he looked closer at the eyes of Jesus, what he saw was not judgment, but he saw compassion. And what he saw was not contempt, but what he saw was concern. And it changed his life. I was reading a book this last week called How to Know a Person. Isn't that a good title? How to Know a Person. Um, It just came out. The author is David Brooks. And he says this. He says, human beings need recognition as much as they need food and water. No crueler punishment can be devised than, than, cease, than to not see someone, to render them unimportant or invisible. And then he quotes George Bernard, George Bernard Shaw, who said this, the worst sin towards our fellow creatures is not to hate them, but to be indifferent to them. That's the essence of of inhumanity. To do that is to say, you don't matter and you don't exist. Now, have you ever felt unseen? Some of you this morning, you may feel unseen in your marriage. You know, you're there but your spouse really doesn't see you. I mean, they don't see your hurts, they don't see your pain. They don't even see your joys. Some of you feel unseen at work. Oh yeah, they need your contribution, but your employer, your coworkers, they don't really see you. They don't see your hurts. They don't see your dreams. You're just a number. You feel unimportant. Here's what you need to know through Matthew, that Jesus, the one who created you, and by the way, Jesus began thinking about you before the earth was founded. That Jesus sees you. He sees your pain. He sees your situation. He understands the challenges and the heartbreak. Jesus sees you. And Jesus saw Matthew. He looked beyond the despicable behavior. He looked beyond the shame. And he saw his heart. And he saw a man made in the image of God who needed redemption. So Matthew has this eye lock with Jesus. And then Jesus starts walking toward him. Matthew's going, oh no, oh no. Here it comes. He's going to call me out. But as he gets closer and stops and looks Matthew in the eye, he says the most unbelievable words he could ever utter. Words that Matthew never thought in a million years he would ever hear from this holy man. Because Matthew had probably heard Jesus preach. I mean, it's not that big a city, Capernaum. And here's Jesus, and he's going to say words that were unbelievable. Here are the words. Jesus says to him, Follow me. I can imagine Matthew going, who are you talking to? You couldn't possibly mean me. You couldn't possibly be asking me to follow you. Jesus, you know who I am. You know what a scumbag I am. And you're asking me to join you, 
You're asking me to walk with you. You're asking me to be one of your students. You're asking me to be in your friend group. You've got to be nuts. And yet, Jesus is saying to Matthew, follow me, because I believe in you. I believe that the life you've lived now up to this point doesn't determine who you're going to be. I've got bigger plans for you. I'm going to change your life. And Matthew is unbelievable. He says, how can this be? But then, what, what does Matthew do? It says this, and Matthew got up and followed him. He got up. He got up out of his booth, closed the door, locked it, gave the key to the Roman, the Roman guard that was probably guarding him, had a line of people still waiting to get taxes collected, says, store closed. I'm now out of business. Matthew is leaving behind his old life. And that's not that easy to do, is it? He's leaving behind riches. He was one of the richest men in Capernaum. He's leaving, he's leaving this cash flow that's incredible because a tax collector in, in Israel in those days, they gained the taxes for Rome, but then they collected commission above that. And guess who set the commission about who, how much they would get on every person's tax? The tax collector himself set his own commission. And he was living off the, the, the poverty of his people and living high on the hog. But he's leaving that all behind. He's going to leave behind sleeping in a mansion to sleeping in a tent. He's going to live, leave behind sleeping in a bed to sleeping on the dirt. Why? Because the author, the offer of Jesus to be in relationship with him, to be accepted by him, was irresistible because it spoke to the deepest parts of his soul. Wow. So he goes on, and he says, while Jesus was having, in verse 10, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, and now this is remarkable. Jesus, the rabbi, the, the healer, the great teacher, the one who people are calling the Messiah, steps into a, defiled house of a publican, of a pagan, as people called Matthew, and had dinner with him. You know what it meant to have dinner back then with somebody? Kind of like it does today. It means you like them. It means you want to be, have fellowship with them. It means you want to be friends. And here's Jesus, the Holy One, having dinner, eating as a friend with this man who has ripped off his countrymen. Wow, what kind of savior do we have? And then he says, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. So Matthew's celebrating, man, I, my old life is over. I'm heading into a new world. I've graduated. Let's celebrate. And he calls all of his friends. So who are his friends? Tax collectors, other scumbags, and sinners. That's who's in this house, and that's who Jesus is fellowshipping with. But here's what I thought was significant about this passage. It says that, that it was sinners came and ate with him, Jesus, and his disciples. Can you imagine what a tumultuous event this was for Peter, for John, for James, to have to sit down in a room full of tax collectors? Oh my goodness. And Matthew, these are the men who had made their life miserable. These are the men who had stabbed them in the back, who had turned them into the Roman officials about their property and being taxed. They hated their guts. And now their rabbi, Jesus, is having dinner with them, and so are his disciples. Isn't that amazing? That Jesus is calling us 
into this radical discipleship that includes accepting and forgiving people who are not like you, that are different. People in this room here are different, and yet God is calling us together to be a family. Now, how are his disciples going to get through the barrier of all their resentment and all their hurt from these tax collectors? God's way to build his kingdom, which is people, by the way, relationships, because he knows we're human, we know we're going to hurt each other, the pathway to unity and to the kingdom is forgiveness. These guys had to forgive Matthew. They had to begin to forgive these tax collectors for what they had done to them. Forgiveness. You know how central forgiveness is to being a follower of Christ? You all know the Lord's Prayer, right? Jesus taught us to pray, and he says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. How important it is for forgiveness? That's not a very long prayer. Most, many of you have it memorized. Forgiveness is right in the heart of that. And in this book, Matthew chapter 6, where this Lord's Prayer is recorded, at the end of that prayer, just to make sure that we get it right, Jesus adds this little addendum. And he says, as you forgive others, so I will forgive you. Wow! Forgiveness isn't optional as a follower of Christ. Forgiveness is essential. It's the heart of who we are to be. So what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is saying, I'm no longer going to make you pay up. I'm no longer going to get revenge. I'm no longer going to try to equal and balance the scales that have obviously favored you. I'm no longer going to call for your pound of flesh. I'm going to let that go. That's what he does. And the reason we're able to do that is because Jesus forgave us. And to, to the amount that Jesus is saying, to the amount that you have received my forgiveness will be the amount that you can forgive others. And that's why Jesus says at the end of that Lord's Prayer that it, I will forgive you as much as you forgive others because I can't open up my heart to Jesus' forgiveness when I can't forgive you. When I haven't forgiven you, it's a sign that I haven't received Jesus' forgiveness in part of my life. That's what it's about. Now, when I accepted Christ, all of my sins, past, present, and future, were forgiven. But experientially, that forgiveness is a process of taking hold in my heart. And that's why I'm always growing in forgiveness. And so his disciples had to take that step to forgive those tax collectors. Now, let me also say this. That forgiveness is not equated to reconciliation. Those are two different things. I can forgive somebody, not demand payment back, but that doesn't necessarily put me in relationship with them. Forgiveness is a one-sided one affair. I can forgive you regardless of what you're doing. Reconciliation takes two people. It takes two to tango. So I can forgive you, but for us to be back in relationship, it also requires, requires repentance on the person who's hurt you. I believe that Matthew and the disciples were, were forgiving, but I believe the reconciliation was on a fast track. Why? Because I believe that when Matthew ex followed Christ, that there was a deep repentance that even the disciples could see. Why do I say that? Because when I look at the tax collector at Zacchaeus in, in the Gospel of Luke, remember what Zacchaeus did? I followed Jesus. I'm giving half of all my money to the poor and to anyone who I've wronged, I'm going to pay them back four times. And I believe that Matthew had that same kind of attitude. And the disciples said, okay, I'm forgiving you, but you look like the real deal to me, Matthew. You like, you're changing. You're giving money to the poor. You're, 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 you're making amends, if you will. 
And so the trust level is growing and the reconciliation, I'm sure it took weeks, months to happen, but eventually Matthew became an accepted part of the disciples. That's a miracle. That's what Christ is calling us to as the body of Christ as well. So, he goes on. He says, verse 11, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Great question. Why does he do that? So Jesus steps up and answers for them. And on hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. So our seven-year-old grandson, Monday, uh, had an ear infection. And uh, you know, you can't get over an ear infection without antibiotics, right? So what my seven-year-old grandson needed, he didn't need a playmate. He didn't need a teacher. He didn't need a toy. You know what he needed? He needed a doctor because he was sick. And Jesus is saying, the healthy who think they're healthy, the reality is we're all sick, but who think they're healthy, they don't need a doctor. I came for those who recognize they need help. I came for, and by the way, my seven-year-old uh, didn't really know that he needed a doctor. He just thought he needed another scoop of ice cream to feel better. Uh, but his parents knew that, right? It's about knowing where we're at. And Jesus is letting the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders leaders, hey, this is what I'm about. I'm coming for these people who are scum, but know it and know they need help. That's who I'm coming from. And guys, are you getting a clue? And so he goes on to say this. He says, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. See, that's the mission of Christmas. That's why Christ came. Not for the righteous, but for the sinners. And he says this, learn about me. I desire mercy, mercy, not sacrifice. So, how do we take this and apply it to our lives? This Christmas season. I think this message, the story is telling us about who God is. And the more accurately we understand who our God is, the more accurately we'll understand how we approach him. And the more accurately we approach God, the more accurately we're going to approach ourselves and others. I think there's basically two ways we try to approach God. One is performance. God, I'm going to base my relationship with you on what I do. What I do. And if I go to church enough, if I read my Bible enough, if I pray enough, if I give enough, I'm going to be right with you, God. And it's up to me to do the right stuff. And, and when I live that way, when I see God as a God who's got his scorecard out and judging me and giving me points or demerits, guess how I'm going to view myself the same way? How's Jim doing? Am I scoring good enough? Am I, am I good enough? And, and usually I'm not. I'm either going to get discouraged or I'm going to, or I'm going to lie to myself and say, well, I'm doing better than most people, Right? Or it's my, it's my wife's fault, of course. That's why I'm blowing it. No. I get into this, and when I live on that performance basis, what it does is it, is it separates me from God. And it separates me from other people. And it separates me from my, even myself. So, that's one way I approach God. If it's based on performance, and by the way, that's the way the religious leaders were approaching God, based on performance. Matthew discovered there's another way to go. What's the other way I approach God? Trust. I'm going to trust in him, not myself. It's not what I do, but it's about what he did. 
It's about trusting not in my works, but it's about trusting in the fact that Jesus came here at Christmas to save sinners, and he did that ultimately by dying on a cross to forgive my sins so I could be made right with God. It had nothing to do with my works. It had all to do with what he did for me. And the result of that is I rest in what he did. That's what Matthew did. So what, how do I rest in what Christ has done? I think we go through the Matthew experience. I think it starts with recognizing that Jesus sees you right where you are. And he's not turned off by your shame. He's not turned off by your guilt. He's not turned off by all your bad habits. He sees through those to you. And he wants you to know he's not judging you. He's concerned about you. He has compassion towards you. He wants the best for you. It starts off with Jesus seeing you where you're at. And then it moves to him inviting you to join him. Following his call in your life. To say, Jesus, I want to walk with you. He wants to walk with you. Isn't that amazing? And he will be with you. This season, some of you are having a hard time because you've lost a loved one. And the holidays just bring, accentuate the absence of that person. Some of you are saying, you know, it, it's, it, it, work is tough right now. Here's what it means to follow and be with Jesus. In the absence of that person, yes, there's a heartache there. But Jesus wants you to know this. He sees the heartache and he's with you. He's with you. He can fill parts of your heart that only he can fill. And yes, you're still missing them, but there's a strength and a comfort from knowing God Almighty through his Holy Spirit is now living and working in you. And for that struggle at work, know that he sees you, but that he's with you to take you through that situation. The words of Jesus are this, Life is much more than what you eat or drink or what you, the living that you make. He says, look at the sparrows in the sky. God takes care of them. He will take care of you. He is with you. That's the message. So, when I'm trusting in Jesus, when I'm resting in what he has done, then my life is going to reflect that. How? Thankfulness. I'm going to be able to be thankful for what Christ is doing in my life today. Not perfect. There's a lot of problems. But there's going to be a thankfulness and a worship in my life. And can I say Christmas time? What a great time. By the way, how many of you are listening to Christmas music? Yeah. You know what? Don't just listen to it at times. But have those moments when you let the words actually sink in you and minister to you and worship him. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay, for Christ the Lord our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Comfort. Let those words mean something to you. I'm amazed I just said that, by the way. That's pretty <laughs> impressive. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, that's, but that's, a, that's the message of Christ, knowing that I don't have to be dismayed. Comfort and joy has come to me today. That's a sign of I'm resting, not in my works, but in what Jesus did. You know what it also means? It means I'm going to repent of having to perform to please people because Jesus did all the performance for me. I can rest in his acceptance. And you know what it also means? It means because I, I don't have to perform to earn, I can now begin to truly love. I can serve selfishly. I can serve without needing to be served back because Christ served me. It's resting in him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for coming. Lord, thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for obeying. Thank you for being willing to humble yourself through, a, through the birth of a little child and showing us the way as you lived your life. 
And Lord, may we embrace the reason that you came at Christmas, to save sinners like me and Matthew. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.